As fallout from the security pact between the US, the UK and Australia reverberates, Joe Biden is seeking to calm France. The US president called an outrage Emmanuel Macron. But can this call soothe tension across the Atlantic over the so-called AUKUS alliance? And will Europe go it alone in defending itself? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Adrian Finnegan. It's meant to counter China's influence in the contested South China Sea, but the so-called AUKUS deal between the US, the UK and Australia has threatened ties between allies. France is angered by what it's called a stab-in-the-back pact and its rallying European partners. It says it found out about the agreement only a few hours before it was announced. And the security partnership has cost Paris a multi-billion dollar deal to build submarines for Canberra. The US and France have made efforts to ease tensions after a five-day standoff. Emmanuel Macron agreed to send the French ambassador back to Washington after a phone call with the US president. And Joe Biden pledged not to cut Paris out of future decisions in the Indo-Pacific region. The two leaders agreed to meet in Europe next month. There have been ongoing discussions and engagements at a variety of levels between the United States and France. So certainly the possibility of a meeting was something that was naturally discussed in advance, uh, but also uh, natural for the president to raise that and discuss it at uh, the leader level. In terms of the tone of the call, uh, it was uh, friendly. Uh, it was uh, uh, one where uh, we're hopeful and the president is hopeful. This is a step in returning to normal in a long, important, abiding relationship that the United States has with France. Well, France also recalled its envoy to Australia in a rare step among allies, and President Emmanuel Macron didn't take a call from Australia's Prime Minister. Scott Morrison says he'll be patient in mending ties with France. We understand their disappointment, and uh, that is the way you manage difficult issues. It's a difficult decision. It was a very difficult decision. And of course, we had to weigh up what would be the, the obvious disappointment to France. But at the end of the day, as a government, we have to do what is right for Australia and serve Australia's national security interests. And I will always choose Australia's national security interests first. Meanwhile, Britain's Prime Minister urged Emmanuel Macron to, quote, get over his anger and give him a break. I just think it's, it's, it's time for some of our dearest friends around the world to, you know, prone and grip uh, about all this uh, and donne moi un break. Uh, because this is uh, fundamentally a, a, a great step forward for global security. Uh, it's three very like-minded allies standing shoulder to shoulder, creating a, a new partnership for the sharing of, of technology. It is not exclusive. Uh, it is not trying to, to shoulder anybody out. It is not adversarial towards China, for instance. European Union leaders have rallied behind France over the dispute. It was seen by the German Minister for Europe as a wake-up call for the bloc on the importance of uniting on foreign and security policy. That show of solidarity came as European leaders are calling for more independence from the US on defence. And the row threatens to delay a major cooperation summit between the US and the EU on trade and technology. Let's bring in our guests for today from Paris. We're joined by Emmanuel Dupuis, President of the Institute for European Perspective and Security. From Brussels, Theresa Fallon is Director of the Centre for Russia, Europe and Asia Studies. And from London, Mushtaba Rahman is uh, Managing Director for Europe at uh, Eurasia Group. Uh, welcome to the programme, all of you. Mushtaba, if we can start with you by going over some relatively recent old ground. France says it's been stabbed in the back. What on earth were these allies thinking, or were the AUKUS allies not thinking of at all? Was this a deliberate ploy to keep France in the dark or a diplomatic snafu? I think your other guests will be able to speak to, um, you know, how the French have perceived what's happened. I think the reaction from Paris is driven really by four factors. One is a belief that there needs to be trust and integrity between allies, and that clearly in this instance was not the case given secret talks have been taking place for more than six months. Of course, France does have substantive interests in the Indo-Pacific region, um, 
these, uh, this agreement obviously cuts across those in quite a direct way. Um, the political economy angle, you know, uh, the loss of the contract and the jobs, I think that's not as an important factor for Macron driving his reaction, as well as the domestic electoral considerations. I think it's a feature Macron needed to get out on the front foot um, regarding what happened, and I think certainly speak to and keep public opinion on his side, but I don't think the reaction was fully and deterministically motivated by domestic politics. So that's how the French feel in terms of what the Allies were doing. I think it's it's a combination of opportunism on the UK side, a change in political leadership on the Australian side, and frankly, poor diplomacy and sloppiness on the American side. Theresa, do you agree with that? Was it sloppy? And what are we to make of the, the joint statement from the White House and the Elysee Palace saying that the situation, perhaps in hindsight, would have benefited from open consultations among allies? Well, I think this is kind of a world of speculation because I would imagine we've seen the strength of the French protest or wine diplomacy about this. And I don't think this would have been able to take place even if there were previous consultations. So I think that was why it didn't leak out at all. It was so important. But on the other hand, in the Australian press, there have been complaints about the French not meeting their delivery dates, the explosion in costs, and the problem of cyber hacking of, of the, the plan. So I think that this was also a concern in Australia. The Australians made that known to the French. I think the French are acting a bit too surprised that this actually happened. And it also means that France feels that they um, it's their biggest fear to, to seem not important on the international stage. So they've not only lost this very important contract, it seems that their kind of historic rival as well as a Brexited UK is working more closely with the United States and Australia. So this is something that's sending a seismic shake, uh, wave across Europe. And Macron, it's an election year for him. He has to act very tough on the international stage, or at least domestically in France. And I think that all of these things have added up. Now, we've seen uh, an olive branch being uh, sent out by President Biden to Macron. And I think that the statement, it actually gave um, President Macron everything he pretty much wanted. He wanted more support in the Sahel, which he's getting. And there was a lot of talk about ending a very important EU-US uh, cooperation schemes. For example, the upcoming Technology Cooperation Council was uh, going to be cancelled uh, because the French were so upset. But I think we should be careful not to complete, conflate France with the EU because it's a bilateral uh, trade issue and it's not that everyone in the EU is necessarily supporting France on this. Okay, Emmanuel, um, do you agree with that, particularly the bit about um, uh, sending extra help to the Sahel. The statement said that the President Biden reaffirms the strategic importance of France and European engagement in the Indo-Pacific region and the US is going to supply extra help to French-led anti-terrorist operations in the Sahel. Is that going to be enough to placate France? Absolutely not. These are words. This is absolutely not what we're expecting. President Biden did not, I think, comply to t totally to what France or a certain person in France were expecting. Of course, he used the diplomatic words of having better consultations, but does that mean that France will be engaged with the United States, Great Britain, the Quad uh, countries who are uh, um, gathering today in the United States in uh, the Southern Pacific? I'm not sure. Does that mean that uh, France and its European partners will have the certainty that European Union and the United States are on the same track when it comes to reassuring the participation of United Nations uh, uh, Chapter 7 operation in Sahel, United States, during the Trump administration, as well as the Biden administration, never accepted to put the G5 Sahel uh, strategic uh, cooperation on the Chapter 7. I'm not sure that, uh, contrary to the contrary of what the American, your other guests spoke about, that uh, President Macron has obtained what he wanted. Absolutely not. OK, so These what... are just diplomatic stance. We're told that the call between Presidents Biden and Macron was uh, friendly enough. What can we expect of the meeting, Emmanuel, between Macron and Biden well, next month? To be, to, to, be, to be honest, we should have expected that the United States would not interfere in the other contracts that we are abiding for in the region. I have, for example, 
uh, I will take the example of the 36 Rafale that we're going to sell to India, in which the United States are trying uh, to, uh, to uh, try to oppose. Uh, I have in mind as well the upcoming 36 Rafale deal that we're going to strike with Indonesia. It is obvious that the United States are pushing for the F-35. So I'm not quite sure that the diplomatic language that was used between the two presidents are sufficient to calm the situation, or at least uh, this is a political statement, this is a domestic issue, that is true. There is huge pressure on President Macron not to uh, uh, go uh, and, and to, put a, to put aside a certain number of statements and to be, like General de Gaulle, be more reassertive. A huge uh, uh, part of the political op uh, opposition here in France are calling to withdraw for the military command of NATO. Theresa, is France deluded in its sense of importance, militarily, politically and diplomatically? That's an interesting term that you use, deluded. I think that the biggest fear for France is that they're going to be seen as irrelevant. And I feel that this is what most diplomats I've been speaking with have mentioned, that the, the real fear of irrelevance and that the UK seems to be the, the chosen partner rather than France in all of this. And there's also a monetary issue in, in regard to this. The previous speaker mentioned, you know, this idea of selling weapons systems. So I think France would like to have these contracts, but we see now there's a political as well as a military and defense security cooperation. So Australia chose France because it wasn't seen as so frightening, I guess, in regard to the neighborhood. But now the strategic landscape has changed dramatically. And so countries really feel that they need to work with not a mini power like France, but a major power like the United States. OK, uh, Mushtaba, would, would, would you agree with that? I mean, is France all right? We'll, we'll use the word irrelevant then rather than deluded. No, I think, um, well, cert certainly, certainly not irrelevant. And we know all about Emmanuel Macron's agenda for not only France, but French power within the European Union and the European Union being more autonomous and having the capability to use uh, the power of the single market to be more strategically autonomous in the world and to look after its, um, its own values and to protect its own interests. I think on the back of what's happened with AUKUS, you will see Macron attempt to Europeanize what is essentially, and I agree with your other speakers, essentially a bilateral problem. But we have seen interventions from the European Commission president, from the European Council president, from the European Parliament president, as well as from a number of other foreign ministers. And I suspect that pressure within France um, and in Europe, um, will grow. What will it ultimately result in, I think, remains remains unclear. Is, is Europe going to put its money where its mouth is and develop real hard power capability? Pro probably not. But you could see the Europeans again deciding to leverage the single market to do more in the area of trade, tech, climate, you know, using its economic and regulatory leverage in a way that enables some of this strategic autonomy to take on more practical meaning. Um, so I don't think the French are irrelevant. Um, um, I do think I do think what has happened does have long-term structural consequences and understanding what those are, I think is gonna take some time. Emmanuel, as, as a G7 and G20 economy, a permanent member of the Security Council, a key member of NATO, one of the key decision makers in the EU and a Pacific power, will the AUKUS allies, Australia especially, come to regret their treatment of France? Well, you are right. You have right to mention that France created the Pacific, Pacific Commission in 1947, that it was one of the leaders and uh, which in 1984 created the Indian Commission. So we are definitely a Asia-Pacific uh, country. 1.6 billion uh, million, sorry, French live in that area. We have 5,000 troops deployed there. And as you know, as we are the second biggest uh, naval um, uh, power, three, four, 35% of that sea is in Asia Pacific. So we are definitely a Asia power. But I'm not sure that France wants to be part of the ACUS, uh, ACUS uh, built up for various reasons. First of all, the ACUS built up is an alliance broadly created to contain militarily the rise of China. Is that a huge preoccupation or is a huge preoccupation for France and other European partners? 
I'm quite sure a certain number of our EU and NATO partners uh, do believe that hybrid uh, warfare, uh, political diplomatic agenda of uh, Ankara as well as of Moscow is a bigger threat and a bigger fear for them. So I'm not sure that France wants to engage in an Anglo-Saxon built up. Of course, Singapore will, will uh, join maybe the ACUS. Of course, the Quad meeting today uh, with Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga plus Prime Minister Scott Morrison and Prime Minister uh, um, Moody is of course abiding the fact that there is this will to contain the rise and the power of China, forgetting maybe two elements. First of all, that the deployment of the soft and hard influence of China is not only in the South Pacific or in the Indo-Pacific area, it is in the African continent, and there we have a say on that, and of course in the Euro-Asian agenda, and of course the situation in Afghanistan has shown uh, that China has overwhelmed and has overshadowed American in their, uh, in the end, uh, by the end of uh, taking consideration their chaos, the chaos of their departure. And of course, we have to take in, in consideration that China is operating in Europe. So the bigger threat and a bigger huge assessment to contain the rise of China, not only in the Asia Pacific area, but in the European continent. Uh, Theresa, do you, do you agree with what you, you just heard there? And where, where does France's relationship now with the AUKUS allies uh, go from here? And, and is it deliberately prolonging uh, this, this spat via a bit of diplomatic theatre, if you like, uh, in order to get something, uh, compensation perhaps? Yes, because we call the Chinese diplomacy wolf warrior and some are calling wine diplomacy. So the more noise France makes, more they can get in exchange. Because clearly, as our previous speaker noted, China, uh, Russia, France has 1.5 million people in this region. It has a lot, a great deal of blue territory. And they are working very closely with the U.S. The French Navy and the U.S. Navy work together in this region. So many analysts have assumed that France, you know, after they have this period of protest, uh, that they will actually have to go back and work with the U.S. because they have interest there and there is close cooperation anyway. And so uh, this idea of strategic autonomy in Europe, I, this has been going on, you know, it's Groundhog Day. It keeps happening over and over again. The U.K. has left. They were a huge uh, defense partner. It, with the EU, but now they're gone. So this idea of strategic autonomy is very, very weak. And the only alternative is to create a stronger European pillar within NATO. And I think that this goes against, you know, Gaullist thinking in France. They always you know, like to think that they're going to lead the rest of Europe. But I think that this is a huge problem. And the other idea that's recurring constantly in Europe is that Russia is really a problem now uh, because the U.S. is becoming more and more laser focused on the Indo-Pacific. And that means Europe will have to up their ante, will have to improve defense spending, burden sharing in, in their own neighborhood. And as the previous uh, speaker pointed out, we've seen Russia-China cooperation in the Mediterranean with naval exercises, Russia-China cooperation in the Baltics. But I don't see this really waking up many Europeans into wanting to increase defense spending. So I think that there really has to be a wake-up call and less, as you mentioned, political theater and real efforts. Enough of the talking and now it's really time to do something. Mushtaba, what's your, your view on that? What are the implications of this, this AUKUS deal, the diplomatic spat, the treatment of France for the EU in particular, and its own security and defence policies and ambitions? I think the answer to that question is perhaps quite straightforward and rather boring. Not, not much, frankly. I mean, look at the internal debate within Germany as they head to their election um, on Sunday. We're looking at a weak German chancellor, probably Olaf Scholz, sitting on top of a fragmented three-party coalition. I mean, the idea we're going to have strong German leadership in Europe, I think is wrong. Um, Emmanuel Macron has his election on the 10th and 24th of April, which means effectively you know, legislative elections in June, which people always forget. So, you know, you're, you're really looking certainly for the next year of a complete lack of synchronization between France and Germany, no real leadership in Europe. Beyond that, what happens structurally, I think, I think you know, is you know, at the margin incremental integration, but nothing meaningful. One piece I think we should bring out, which is important, is French-UK ties. Those, I think, are extremely strained. We've got to remember the context for the bilateral Franco-UK-France UK relationship. It was already one where there was really little trust. 
because of Boris Johnson gov government behaviour on implementation regarding the protocol. And this has obviously fed into that context, you know, relations were not starting from a blank sheet of paper. Mm. And, and the, the last point I will make very briefly is, I do believe we're moving to a situation for the UK and Europe, which will be a bit more tense and a bit more escalatory. It's highly likely the UK will suspend the Northern Ireland Protocol um, and not abide by the commitments that they signed up to in 2019. And that again is going to, I think, really exacerbate the bilateral okay. relationship. Okay, Emmanuel, how did those those comments from from Boris Johnson go down there in France when he, when he he told President Macron to get a grip and give him a break? <laughs> well, we're laughing about it. You know, we consider Great Britain as a junior partner, and this is one of the reasons we did not. Uh, call back uh, Catherine Colonna, the uh, French ambassador in London. Uh, London is uh, just abiding by an American agenda. And I think, uh, to be very honest, we cannot, of course, compare the huge strength, military strength of the United, Na of the United States, uh, more or less seven uh, billion of dollars of uh, defense, defense spending, of course, with the minor uh, European implication, not more than 186 million, uh, billion, sorry, of euros. But to be honest, uh, we can compare some elements. First of all, there are only three major military powers in the Western uh, uh, hemisphere, or at least who have the full spectrum of military capacity, and that is France, that is Great Britain, and that is United States. We built submarines, we have nuclear deterrence, we are deployed around the world, and we have a full spectrum capability of Deploying troops, we are deploying troops in Africa, we are deploying troops in uh, Syria and Iraq, and we still are deploying some troops in Iraq. So I think, uh, not to bully on the Great Britain side, uh, we have to take in consideration that there's a lot of political okay. agenda, both in Australia, both in France, and both in Great Britain. A certain number of Australian leaders are not very happy about this, the decision made by Scott Morrison. Uh, previous Prime Minister Kevin Rudd or Malcolm Turnbull or Tony Abbott uh, decided to get uh, to be very precise, saying it was a political mistake to yeah. bully on France okay. and to only decide to this, to, to speak with uh, the, with the Americans. Right. And I think this is the same thing with Great Britain. Emmanuel, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to, to, to butt in here, but we're running out of uh, time uh, here. Theresa, just one, one more question here about President Biden. A French politician uh, described Biden's sidelining of France as a blunder amounting to a strategic blindness that will only benefit the Chinese. Is he right? How damaged is Biden's reputation in Europe? I think everyone really understands that this wouldn't have happened if it was if there was consultation. And I think the U.S. has made it quite clear under the Biden administration that they're going to work with mini laterals, with coalitions of the willing and these smaller groupings, because otherwise it's just too difficult to do. For example, with the EU 27 member states, it's impossible to get them to all agree on one thing. So all you need is one member state to block it. And we've seen that happen over and over again. So now they're kind of upping it. Uh, this. AUKUS is, is the beginning, I think, of more many laterals, and I think this is the future. I think France will understand and get along uh, because it needs to. It needs more defense and security cooperation with the U.S., and this period, I think, of protest uh, will end. And I think that everyone understands it's in French interests as well. And as I mentioned earlier, I think we must keep an eye on the ball here that it was because France was unable to deliver and that they had uh, increased dramatically the cost to Australia that Australia thought, why don't we just buy nuclear uh, armed subs or what um, powered submarines? Because that was pretty much the price that France was charging them for diesel engines. So I think that we France should really reflect on this. And it's not only Australia that has been complaining about the French uh, military defense complex. I hear Germans complaining about it. I hear other countries. So I think that they really do need to maybe look inwards. And if they want to be a big exporter of these uh, weapon systems, they need to improve. OK, there we must leave it. Many thanks indeed, Emmanuel Dupuy. Uh, Teresa Fallon and Mashtaba Rahman, uh, thank you, as always, for watching. Don't forget you can see the programme again at any time just by visiting the website at aljazeera.com. For further discussion, join our Facebook page. That's at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can join the conversation on Twitter, our handle at AJ Inside Story. From me, Adrian Finnegan, and the whole team here in Doha. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again. Bye for now.